Well, thank you so much, Latoya, for taking me from London. We met a month ago at another conference, again, on the same issue. And when you invited me, we'd like to come to work, I said, sure. I mean, this is, a, this is my second time at work in two years, actually a year. Uh, I was here for a TED Talk about like six months ago. Uh, and I was looking forward to come back, and uh, thanks for having me tonight here. And thanks to you all for coming. Um, uh, we, we could have done this talk in Turkish, unless if the Turkish people are a little more, but I'll keep it in English. Uh, and you know, please try the Turkish dessert if you haven't if you haven't done. Um, as Latoya said, I mean, my book is about the issue of freedom in Islam. Uh, I'm not. I don't define myself as a libertarian. Uh, I'm less, I would say, ideological on the matter, but I'm a person who believes in human liberty. And uh, so I share many views with my libertarian friends or my classical liberal friends, and I'm probably closer to classical liberalism if, based, if you look at from politics and economics from that angle. Um, but, but liberty is, of course, an important matter. And I think it's also a very important matter, especially for the Muslim world. You know, um, after 9 11, you know, this term modern Islam became very fashionable in the West. And I understand the reasoning behind that, but it doesn't also explain that much. Because uh, in term, if moderatism is a rejection of political violence, the overwhelming majority of Muslims in the world are moderate. I mean, the people who would sympathize with terrorism or you know, such bloodshed uh, is very marginal you know, in the Muslim world. Uh, but the issue of liberty, uh, human freedom, is another issue which I think it, it should be debated even more than about this terrorism or political violence issue. Because someone can be moderate, but also illiberal. I mean, someone can be moderate, but not very open to different ideas, not very tolerant to the issue of human freedom. And uh, some people assume that every religion, uh, since they tell people to obey the commandments of God, uh, inevitably you know, uh, infringes or blocks human freedom. I was actually on a talk today, and an atheist in the, uh, like, uh, one of the guests in the conference was an atheist, and he said, well, doesn't belief in God by its nature, you know, make people de deprived from their freedom? And I said, well, I understand that there's an atheist way through freedom, but my way is not that way. And I think, uh, because I think that and my way, or the Islamic way, I mean, to, I mean, I don't claim to be an authority there, of course, but the Islamic way, or the Christian way, or the Jewish way, is... Is to, is to believe in God and then be free from social or political pressure because of your belief. So you want freedom for your belief. And I think that's a, there's a very clear case for freedom from uh, emerging from that religious tradition. Now first let me tell you how I got into this issue. And uh, I think uh, there's a story that I also share in the beginning of my book uh, and let me also share with that right now. Uh, it goes back to some three decades ago that I first had my encounter with the issue of Islam and freedom. I, I wouldn't name it that way then, but years later I said, okay, this is the first experience I started to think about this. I was at the age of nine, and uh, my parents were reasonably religious, but my grandparents were very pious, very religious. And I was going to my grandfather's house every summer to learn about Islam, you know, to learn about religion. So, I learned how to pray, I learned how to read Arabic you know, in, a, in a very you know, primitive way. I used colorful beads to write La ilaha illallah, which means there is no God but God. I learned how to go to mosque and the basic things, and I loved it. I loved everything that I learned from my grandfather. I was in Ankara, in Turkey's capital. One day in my grandfather's library, uh, there was a book which teaches things about prayer. Namaz which is the Turks would know what, what I'm talking about. It's a basic introduction to prayer. It's a basic book for religious knowledge. Uh, and at the back side of the book, there were two quotes. And the first quote was from the Quran. It said, uh, I remember, it said, uh, it is God who has created you and who has given you eyes, ears, and your hearts. How little thanks you give. And I was quite inspired and impressed by the words. I thought, things that I have, my body and my, my, my senses and my feelings are given to me by God that I should be thankful for that. It was very inspiring. But the second quote, which was not from the Quran, was a little worrying. It said, if your children do not start to pray at the age of 10, then beat them up. 
Now here, I was at the age of nine, learning that in a year I might be in trouble, you know, if I if I don't start to pray, you know, five times a day regularly. And I remember asking about this my, to my grandfather, and he said, "No, no, don't worry about that. Of course, it doesn't, you know, count for you, and that's for bad kids, and don't worry about it." <laughs> and I did not. But that day, I think, in my very naive childness, childhood, uh, still I sensed a problem there, and a question uh, came to my mind, and I think that question was carved to my mind: uh, Would it be really helpful if you beat people if they don't pray? Would this make them really pious believers? Would this make them really feel much much more enlightened, much more inspired? Uh, or would you just be making them resentful? And I think that is a question that uh, Muslims around the world need to ask uh, in our day and age. Because we see in various parts of the world, um, I'm not saying all Muslim communities, but in some Muslim communities, there's a tendency to use coercion for you know, for the so for the hoped or so-called benefits or for the purposes of religion, and of course one of the extreme cases is Saudi Arabia. I don't know if you've been to Saudi Arabia, but I've been to Saudi Arabia, and uh, they have a phenomenon called the religious police mutawa in Arabic. And when the prayer time comes, mutawa with sticks in their hands basically force you to pray and go to mosque. At least they force you to close your shop. Shop owners have to turn you know close your uh, the, the I don't know what's called it like this Kapankin church, but I don't know how to say that. Blind, yeah. Uh, yeah, they they have to put their blind down and show that they are praying when the prayer time comes. Now the question is this: Does this really make people more godly? Does this really make people more <coughs> genuinely obedient to God, or does this make them hypocrites? I mean. Well, we can't know the heart of every person, but I think it is a famous story among Turks that some Saudis who are wearing chadors and very pious things, they catch the first flight to London and they come here to the wildest bars and parties. Uh, and some Iranians, uh, also known in Turkey, that you know they can't have alcohol in Iran, at least they have it secret. So they come to Turkey again to, uh, to benefit from Turkish nightlife scene. Uh, so apparently what that coercion creates is, it does not only deprives people from freedom as a general human idea, but from an Islamic point of view, it also doesn't make them pious, genuinely pious. Now, if you are only concerned about the stability of your regime and the justification that you create for the regime by saying we are such a pious society, maybe you don't care about this. But if you really care about the genuine heartfelt piety of people, you should care about this, and maybe you should question these things. And of course there are other examples, like you know, when some uh, cartoonists in Europe makes a cartoon of Prophet Muhammad that I don't like, other Muslims of course do not like, uh, how Muslims should respond? I mean, should they respond by simply saying that they find it disrespectful and they criticize it, or should they respond by violent reactions or even threats? Uh, or when someone writes a book that, you know, again, challenges Islamic faith, what should be the Muslim reaction? Should they use coercion? Should they try to ban these books? Uh, or should they maybe write criticism? <coughs> so this, this issue of freedom is, I think, a major issue for, uh, for anybody, uh, for any Muslim in the, in the modern day and age, uh, because it has become a universal value. And uh, Muslims, uh, some of the sources that Muslims refer to, uh, have some themes that are not compatible with the idea of freedom. Uh, so what are we going to make of this? I mean, what, what should be the Muslim answer and what should be the Muslim solution to this issue? That's, that was the concern that I had uh, while writing this book. And I found, I mean, I, I've been studying Islamic sources for at least two decades, but especially on this issue of freedom I've been working on the past several years, I would say. And when I especially began to write this book, I saw what I found was uh, was a basic was was a uh, was a story or which confirmed my intuitions that most of the authoritarian coercive elements in Islamic law and culture actually does not come from Islam. If Islam is really what God has revealed, it comes from historical interpretations. It comes from particular historical contexts. Let me give you, a, give you a very clear example of this. In classical Islamic law, in Sharia, uh, in the four major Sunni schools of the Sharia, uh, apostasy is considered as a crime. 
apostasy is, you know, changing your religion for something else. Uh, I mean, if you're a Muslim and if you decide to become a Christian, then you're in trouble. Uh, the, 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 the punishment given for this crime uh, is death penalty. So, I mean, if you change your religion, you can get killed, according to classical Islamic law. And there are some countries which implement this law. In Afghanistan, it became a worldwide issue in 2006 when Abdurrahman, a, a, a man named Abdurrahman, uh, decided to become a Christian and he was given the death penalty by the court and, and the whole Western world, as you can imagine, you know, criticized that and there was a lot of uh, uproar and then the court, you know, decided to change the decision, but not the law itself, of course. Uh, in, in Malaysia, actually, in, in, in your country, there this is an issue, uh, because uh, when a Malay, which is defined by the constitution as a Muslim, every Malay is a Muslim according to the constitution. It's like our constitution which says every citizen is a Turk. Uh, so the constitution defines you, you do not define the constitution anyway. Uh, it says, I mean, Malays are Muslim, and socially they are expected to be Muslims. So what, what happens if they become Christian? Now, of course, no Muslim would like to see someone, a fellow believer, become a Christian or an atheist. That, I mean, that's, a, that's okay, that's a different discussion. But what, what happens if you do that, if that person changes mind? Uh, now, what, when you look at the other way around, of course, Christians become Muslims, and of course, Muslims are Happy to see that, they're welcome. I mean, we say, oh, it's so great that Yusuf Islam, I mean, Katsilus became Yusuf Islam, wonderful. But had uh, a Yusuf something, had become Kat something, you know, like it, it was the other way around, that would be a big issue. Uh, so what are we going to make this apostasy law? Now, my answer to that, and I have a chapter on this in the book, uh, solely on this issue, is that, well, first of all, the apostasy ban is simply not in the Quran. There's nothing in the holy book of Islam, the sacred scripture of Islam, Quran, that says anything uh, that brings any earthly punishment for apostasy. Well, the Quran says unbelievers will go to hell, but you know that's an afterlife. That doesn't bring any earthly punishment for for our world. Uh, and it's up to God, you know, to when you die, and you know, it says uh, I mean, atheists or secular people don't believe in that anyway, and Muslims can't hope for the afterlife. But that's a different discussion. On on the earthly level, on this earth, there's nothing. Actually, there are verses in the Quran which hint that such a ban on apostasy doesn't make sense. I mean, there's a famous verse, uh, there's no compulsion in religion, in Surah Al-Baqarah. There's another verse which says, the truth is from your Lord. Let anyone who wants to believe it, believe it. Let anyone who wants to disbelieve it, disbelieve it. Uh, there's a part, even a verse which says that those who believe and disbelieve, that who believe and disbelieve, and then, you know, increase in, in disbelief, you know, will be punished in afterlife. Which shows that people at the time of Prophet Muhammad actually could change their faith, but, you know, still remain alive, and they were not given capital punishment. Uh, so, where does this banner apostasy come from, then? Well, it comes from secondary sources of Islam. Uh, from the hadiths, uh, sayings attributed to the Prophet Muhammad, which have been controversial, you know, since the beginning. Secondly, from the interpretations of the hadiths by medieval scholars. And when you look at both the hadiths and the interpretation by medieval scholars, there is something very important that you see. They were thinking in a context in which the apostate means traitor in a wartime. In other words, at the time that they were thinking this issue, apostasy meant that you are changing your side in battle. Because the Muslim community at war with the pagans of Mecca, they were at war with the Byzantine Empire and the Sassanids and you know, various forces in the early decades and centuries of Islam. So if you, changing your religion was not just a change of opinion, you were basically deserting from one army and joining the other army. And high treason in every society still today is considered as a crime. Uh, and that's why, for example, the Hanafi school of law, the, one of the Sunni schools, the more flexible one, uh, considered the death penalty only valid for males, not the females, assuming that females won't be the enemy combatants. Only the males will be the combatants. Uh, I'm not you know, trying to you know, bring any non-feminist approach here. I'm just saying that they thought that way. You know, in the medieval times, you know, females were not con considered as enemy you know, soldiers, but males were considered that way. Now, when you understand this, well, you think you start to say, okay, well, 
Of course, this doesn't make sense today. It's made sense in the past, maybe, you know, in, in a war situation. But we live in a totally different world. So the purpose of that apostasy ban doesn't make any sense today. So Muslims have to revisit and reform and abolish, you know, this ban on apostasy. I think, I mean, that's a rational calculation, uh, a rational assessment, you know, of the situation. Uh, but of course, if you never question, you know, what is written there and for what purpose, you can say, literally, this is written this way and we will not change it. And now, if you keep on obeying everything in Islamic law, literally, you would have a lot of pr problems. Uh, for example, and, well, some countries have a lot of problems. For example, again, come back to the Saudis. You know, in Saudi Arabia, uh, there is a ban on women's driving. I mean, if you're a woman, you cannot drive a car in Saudi Arabia. You can't even take a hotel room, <laughs> that's a different thing, but you, you simply cannot get on a plane or like a, a car alone. Uh, you should have a driver or your uh, father or your husband should drive for you. Now, why? You know, what's the point? Well, the Saudis refer to a hadith, a saying attributed to Prophet Muhammad, which says, literally, do not send the woman alone to the desert the women, uh, do not send women alone to the desert. Now, if you read it that way and you say, well, it's obvious, so we should not send them alone to anywhere, so ban everything. Well, I asked this to the director of the Buddhist Affairs in Turkey, Mehmet Gürmez, Professor Mehmet Gürmez, when he was at the head of the Hadith project in Turkey. Well, he said, well, we, first of all, we are not sure whether that Hadith is uh, uh, like, uh, authentic or not. Secondly, if the Prophet said so, probably he said so, because at the time, in, in 7th century Arabia, between Mecca and Medina and other cities, there were bandits uh, in the desert. And so if just a few women were traveling alone without any protection, they would probably be attacked and killed and raped and God knows what. So it was obviously something related with the context. But if you, you know, deprive it from the context, and if you think that this is valid forever, you do what Saudis do, you don't think about it, and you do you turn something that is a protection for women into an oppression of women, into a, into a tyrannical ban on women in blocking their basic freedoms. Now I think this contextual approach is therefore I think very important and when you do that you actually understand why things were decided that way then in that context but you understand why they should be changed. But in Islam some school of, schools of thought are open to change, some schools of thought are not open to change. And uh, this, uh, when you look at this why, you know, some schools of, of thought are this way or that way, again, you should go back to some of the early debates in Islam. Now, one of the early debates in, this, in, uh, in the formative centuries uh, was whether reason had any role in understanding, you know, uh, the truth. Every Muslim, of course, believed in revelation, the Quran and basic example, the, the example of the Prophet, but how to articulate that and how to use whether reason had any role in understanding this was a big, big issue in the, in the early centuries. There was actually a big uh, theological, I would say, this uh, war and even sometimes a political war between the people who defended reason, they were called the uh, Ehli Rey in Arabic, which means the people of reason, versus the Ehli, uh, ehli Hadith who thought everything should be justified only on, uh, on the acquired wisdom, Nakid in Arabic. And uh, this is an important discussion actually, because if you say reason can also find some truth, you open the way for learning from other civilizations. For example, if you say God has given us uh, revelation, but also human reason can find not everything, but some basic truths. Uh, then you, you can say, well, then this means that maybe the Greek philosophers found some interesting ideas and we can learn from them. And that's thanks to that interpretation, Islamic thought you know, incorporated Aristotle, Plato, and different thinkers in the Middle Ages. But if you say, no, no, reason leads astray, then you basically shut, cut, cut yourself from the outside world and only rely on what you have in tradition. Uh, and the, the champion of this reason school uh, was the school called the Mutazila in early Islam. And some of the Mutazila, I would say, a bit, went a bit extreme. But their uh, influence can also be traced in Abu Hanifa, the founder of the Hanafi school, and even in Maturidi, Imam Maturidi, the founder of the Maturidi school, which acknowledged that 
even there, if there were no revelation, human beings would be able to come to some basic conclusions about this world. For example, he said, even if God did not say that, by reason we would know that theft is wrong or killing is wrong. Uh, whereas the opposite school, the, uh, the uh, Hanbali school, said uh, it, it was Imam Hanbal was their you know most important champion. Uh, their motto was "Bila Kefa" in Arabic, which means "without asking how." So they said you should believe without asking how, and if you discuss any matters, discussing it, it's that that very discussion is a sin and it leads to astray. So these early, you know, I, I get into my book about these old early discussions, uh, and ultimately Islamic thought, you know, after the initial centuries, and very interesting ideas emerged at the time. For example, I will go on to the reason issue once, but I'll, let me tell you one more thing. One of the early discussions in Islam was on the issue of who has ultimate access to the truth, who knows what is right. Now, uh, there, was, uh, there was a political war between uh, Ali radiallahu anh, the fourth caliph, and Muawiyah, the fifth caliph. So they had a political confrontation. And a particular school called Hawarij, Harijites, the dissenters, uh, a very extremist group, said that both sides in this conflict are wrong, only we are right, and we condemn every other Muslim except us. So these were the extremists or the, of the, um, if you will, <coughs> seventh century. They were even terrorists by today's measures because they started to attack other Muslims just for no reason, considering themselves as you know apostates. Uh, so this was the the most rigid fundamentalist, if you will, school. Now at the very outer opposite, there was another school called the Mujahids. Uh, this term, Arabic term, obviously, is in English. It's translated as the postponers. Now, why they're called postponers? Because they said, well, we don't know who's right and wrong. Only God knows that, ultimately. So let's postpone this debate to afterlife. There's a verse in the Quran, actually, which says, God will decide uh, uh, upon the things that you disagreed when you come to God, which means in afterlife. So they referred to that verse, and they said, let's just do what we do. Let's just believe in what we believe. Let's do our you know, practice. Uh, and basically agree to disagree, but let's leave it to afterlife. And I think that was a very strong basis for pluralism, for example. Again, you see that thinking in the Hanafi school in Islam, the traces of that sort of thinking. And I was quite struck when I read the same argument from none other than British liberal thinker John Locke. In his A Letter Concerning Toleration, he says, oh, a thousand years from the postponer of Mujiites, he says, uh, there are different churches in England only the Almighty knows which one is ultimately right, so let them just do what they do and let them tolerate each other. And that was his argument for you know basis. Of course, you know, there's always an earthly benefit to claim that you have the truth. So it's always a tempting to say that, a tempting thing. But I think the Mujahid argument for pluralism was a much better one, I think, a, a, a base for peace. Now, these early discussions in Islam are important, and I think even we Muslims have forgotten some of them. And I think there are some important theological tools there to go back to, you know, see how our religion unfolded, and maybe some of the things that we can uh, revitalize today. But I should say also, the impact of this, both the plural, pluralist Murgiites, and most, more, the, the, more so, not the Uthazilites, but a tamed version of their rationalism, lived in the Hanafi school and the Maturidi school in Islam, which was the official idea, official creed of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, that's why in the 19th century, when the Ottomans faced modernity, faced something called democracy, you know, faced uh, things like constitutional system, elections, parties, and so on, they did not say, well, this is totally unacceptable, this is totally un-Islamic. The Ottomans started to look at these things, gradually accept some of these concepts. So, in order to start to, in other words, in other words, began to modernize the empire and reconcile this with Islamic uh, culture and law. I'm referring to the period called Tanzimat in Turkish, the organization period, in uh, beginning in 1839. Uh, that was a period that the Ottoman statesmen and intellectuals look at Europe. They, they realize that Europe's success comes from democracy, Europe's com success comes from freedom, from economic enterprise. And, and they also thought 
these inventions of Europe, admirable as they are, are also found in the early ideas of Islam. For example, on the for example, issue of limiting Sultan's power with law, Nama Kemal argued, well, this is what Sharia was all about. We just forgot it. So maybe Europeans had advanced this in a better way and created a system called constitutionalism. But we can, we can take those ideas, but also fa find their sources in our own civilization. Or when they faced democracy, they said, well, the Quranic principle of consultation actually is very much you know, in line with that uh, idea. So there, in the Ottoman Empire, there was this period in which uh, liberal democracy was accepted, but it was articulated in Islamic terms. Um, and a particular school of thought in late Ottoman Empire called the Young Ottomans, I think is very important there. We Turks forgot those things, unfortunately, in the Republican era. Uh, not the Young Turks, that's a later cadre, a more secular and nationalist cadre. Young Ottomans, like Nama Kemal, were people who were inspired by the liberal ideas in the West, but wanted to you know, incorporate them in an Islamic, you know, in an Islamic uh, manner. That's why, for example, the Ottoman Empire abolished the system of zimmi, the, uh, Jews and Christians, which means, you know, protected uh, in classical Islamic law. So, in classical Islamic law, well, sorry, Jews and Christians were protected, they were given rights, but they were not equal citizens. But the Tanzimat reforms gave them equal citizenship rights, and that's why in the Ottoman Parliament, opened in 1876, one third of the Parliament was non-Muslim. Uh, and in the Ottoman bureaucracy, you had many Greeks and Armenians and Jews, in, again, in the last uh, decades. Uh, the Ottomans also abolished the ban on apostasy, something not very much discussed in the Turkish context today. Selim Dedingen has a very important article about that. And they also reformed uh, family law. They, gave for, they basically made uh, polygamy almost uh, impossible because they gave women to the right to state in their marriage contract that there won't be any more you know, marriages in the family. Uh, so by gradually, they brought many, many uh, gradual refinements. And Ahmed Javed Pasha, an Ottoman scholar, uh, in his famous law, Mejalle, he stated a very important maxim. He said, as times change, laws should change. So that was an echo of the more rational strain in Islam, which understands that laws of Islam has a purpose, and the, the change of society should lead you to question some of the... Uh, some of the rulings because maybe they don't say, serve the same purpose today. And today, in a much, much, much changed world, I think that idea that as times change, laws should change, should be more and more used uh, by Muslims. However, in the 20th century, this whole reform period in the Ottoman Empire and its Arab counterpart, I mean, I haven't mentioned that, but in the, uh, in the Arab context, there was a whole liberal age in the 19th century. Albert Hurani speaks about this in his book, uh, Arabic thought in the liberal age. So there were many Muslim thinkers who realized that Islamic world is stagnated, who realized that you know, they should in, in, uh, incorporate some of the achievements of Europe, but they should articulate them in Islamic terms and they should find their counterparts in Islam, created very important ideas. But that liberal era ended tragically and uh, very dramatically in the 20th century. Uh, I mean, Pakistani scholar Jawit, who's an expert on the history of thought in the Islamic world, he says there was a there was this promising liberalism in late 19th and early 20th century in in the Muslim world, but just gradually, it just dramatically and actually quite suddenly actually died out in the second quarter of the 20th century. Why? I mean, I thought, I, I have a chapter on that. Well, because the political context had changed in the 19th century, Europe was an example to emulate for Muslims. In, with the fall of the Ottoman Empire, the whole Middle East was colonized by European powers. So colonialization inevitably led to anti-colonial feelings, which led to na Arab socialism, Arab nationalism, uh, and a basically a defensive, reactionary uh, attitude towards the West, understandably so. And even when the colonial powers went, what they left behind was not democracy, but, but secular dictators in most Arab countries. I mean, like uh, in, in Tunis, Bourguiba, and in, in, in Arab countries, they, they did not sometimes intentionally leave behind, but in most of the Arab countries, you had one-party states, like the Ba'ath dictatorship in Iraq, the Ba'ath dictatorship in Syria, still, you know, cracking down on some people. Uh, the Mubarak, I mean, the Nasser Mubarak line in Egypt, uh, Qaddafi in Libya. So instead of a gradual democratization, you had very 
uh, authoritarian dictatorships. And these dictatorships suppress Islamic groups, making more, them more and more radical. So you have this vicious cycle in the Arab world. For example, Nasser suppressed the, and his uh, Sadat and Mubarak, they, support, they suppress Islamic movements, like Islam, Islamic Brotherhood, and then you had radical offshoots you know, from, this, uh, from this group. And Islamic Brotherhood also got, I mean, when you look at uh, ideas of Saint Qutb, you see it is a reaction to an oppressive, uh, oppressive state. One country, though, has been partly able to escape from this vicious cycle between authoritarian dictators and a, you know, a, you know, a, 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 a reactionary Islamist movement. It is Turkey. Uh, I mean, uh, I'm not saying this because I'm Turkish and you know, I'm writing in the Turkish context, but I think it's fair to say that Turkey has been a bit more lucky First of all, it preserved some of the Ottoman tradition, thanks to movements in Turkey and thinkers like Said Nursi, or later Fethullah Gülen, and other uh, movements in Turkey who are rooted in the tradition. So they never rejected democracy. They thought, actually, democracy is the Islamic way to go, uh, politically. Uh, and they, they never you know, became open to the more radical you know, totalitarian movements that emerged uh, in the Muslim world. Secondly, before then, any other Arab country, Turkey had the blessing of democracy. We had our first free and fair elections in 1950. I mean, like Arab countries, when we became independent, we didn't become a democracy right away. We had a 25-year-long one-party state, an authoritarian secular dictatorship, uh, our Ba'ath uh, period, if you will. But in 1950, that, that one-party rule had to trans, you know, had a, had a transition to its you know, multi-party system, and since then, pious Muslims in Turkey, who have been oppressed by the system in various ways, knew that they could bring political parties to power, uh, so they never aspired something other than democracy. In fact, in Turkey, democracy has growingly become the pious conservative Muslim cause, whereas military coups have been the secular, you know, uh, you know uh, divide, tool against that. That's why some of the dichotomies that Egypt, Egypt is speaking today, well, I mean, Tunisia just had its first and fair you know, elections just last, last month. Egypt is aspiring to have that these days, and we don't know whether the military will be you know, continue, uh, continuing its rule. Syria is, you know, the heroic people of Syria are trying to struggle and are struggling with uh, the dictatorships that they have. But Turkey was able to keep that you know, reform line going on gradually. Uh, and in the past 10 years, uh, 20 years in Turkey, when you look at some of the discussions about Islam, it is universally almost accepted in Turkey that you know apostasy laws are obsolete and they don't respect, they don't you know they don't reflect uh, uh, the uh, all the values of Islam. It is uh, the the secular state as a principle is accepted by a majority of Muslims in Turkey. Turkish Prime Minister Erdogan, you know the so-called Islamist <laughs> leader of Turkey even advocated secular state uh, during his uh, visit to the Arab countries recently. Uh, and I would say liberal democracy as an idea is uh, making more and more inroads to the uh, Muslim, uh, pious Muslim camp in Turkey. Although still we had need a lot of discussions and you know, we need internal debates, but I think there's a more advanced case. So I wrote this book basically to, first of all, tell about this history, tell about this process, and also push it further a little bit by asking some of the questions and showing how they can be answered in a way which really upholds human freedom. And I think uh, these are this issue, the freedom issue, is the issue, is the main issue that uh, Muslim movements will face in the years to come. When Nahda runs Tunis, in for example, they will ask like, what about you know hijab? They will be you know forceful movement, uh, or what about you know the freedom to sin, as it is called. Uh, and these issues are things Muslims will face, and I think it's it's time to give a principled response to these issues. And uh, yesterday I was speaking to an audience, actually at the British Parliament, and someone said, well, what about if the state doesn't enforce religion, what about piety and how will we uphold? And I said, well, we should uphold piety morals not with religious police, but by religious responsibility. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's a time that you know, Muslims should strengthen their faith and you know, use civil society, charities, and NGOs, and so on to advance their faith. It's their best, most basic rights. I'm a Muslim, I'm you know, saying this as a, as a Muslim. 
Uh, but I think it's not a time that uh, coercion, it, I mean, it was never actually the Islamic ideal, but by coercing people to remain in faith, by coercing people to be pious, you only can make them hypocrites, and that's really not what Islam is all about. Thank you so much. So let me stop here, and if you have questions, objections, I would love to. First off, could we give Ms. Ma a word from Does anybody have any questions? Yes, please. Wait, by the way, do you think we can find a glass of water or something? Oh, yes, of course. That, Absolutely. It's so, possible. Right. I'll get you that. <laughs> so, Johnny, would you like to continue with your okay. question? Um, First of all, thank you very much uh, for a very interesting talk, or uh, should I say, an Bishop Kamil Oh, that's great! <laughs> I, I, I will say, as an, as an Englishman, I am grateful that you did not do the speech attacks on this occasion. Well, you're welcome. <laughs> yeah. I, I was thinking about it, but you, know, you changed my mind. <laughs> um, I, was, I, I, I was very interested to, to hear you talk about um, uh, Syed Qutb uh, very, very briefly, yeah, and I'm, I'm sure that uh, if he were alive today, he no doubt, uh, not look very favourably on your on your yeah. work, perhaps described as uh, you know uh, Jackalia in book four. Yeah. Um, I, I was I was wondering if, if you uh, if you agree that with the with the rise of unfortunate rise of, of cultivism and, and its uh, and its like copycat doctrines, whether you yeah. agree with um, uh, Simon Salvi when she said that Islam at the moment is going through uh, its own dark age. Mm -hmm. Uh, I would say an age of crisis. Uh, this is, I mean, the 20th century has been the most traumatic uh, age century of Islamic civilization, I would say. Uh, Qutb uh, was, I mean, I respect Qutb in some senses. I mean, he was a man of principles and he believed in what he believed. But I think he, his ideas, grovingly actually, became radicalized. He was tortured for years, and, you know, under the, in the, in the dungeons of uh, Nasser. And he began to see Islam in a very politicized way. So when Islam speaks about justice and so on, he understood this as abolishing the world system and creating a new old world system by force. Uh, and in a less, a bit less, but still, Mevdudi had a similar idea. He defined Islam again as a political party is a political goal. Uh, actually, it's just funny that Mamdudi, writing in the 30s, says, he speaks about fascism and communism, and he says, Islam is a bit similar to fascism and communism in the sense that it uh, en encompasses the whole society, but of course they have the wrong ideas, we have the right ideas, but we can use the same tools. Of course, he, would, he didn't say this after you know, seeing fascism and all its crimes, but so these thinkers were, to some extent, influenced actually by the West, but f from the more totalitarian ideas in the West. And they saw the state as, as the new guide of the society, and, but the state would guide society via Islam. Whereas I believe that you know, whoever uses the state for any idea is actually creating a trouble, because um, it is inevitably authoritarian to use the state to shape the society. Uh, and, uh, and also, if you want to create an Islamic state, inevitably you are creating the state of the Islam that you believe in. I mean, like, uh, Iran is an Islamic state, right? Well, it's Shiite. It is, it is, it is an Islam of its own. It's a republic. Saudi Arabia is an Islamic state. It's not a republic, it's a monarchy. There's no parliament. And it is Wahhabi, so none of them really appeal to me. I mean. Uh, someone can't else. So they are, it is the state of Islam that they understand. So there are many different ways to understand Islam. As the postponer said, nobody knows which one is ultimately right. So we Muslims can follow the school, schools that we believe in. But if you make any of them the official doctrine, you are basically imposing that particular school on others. So there is a problem in the Islamic State. So come to back to your question. Yeah, I agree with that, the 20th century. Well, I wouldn't say maybe Dark Ages. There are also bright moments, a lot of, you know, positive things to say about the 20th century Islamic world, and I think Turkey represents some of them. Uh, thanks so much. That's right. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for your time. But yeah, it's been a traumatic era. Actually, I have a chapter in the book which uh, 
says, with a reference to Toynbee, that the Islamic world of the 20th century is a bit like the situation of Jews during, during the time of Jesus Christ. Uh, in the way that uh, Jews thought they are God's chosen people and they have God's revelation, but they were politically and militarily threatened by Rome, a powerful alien civilization, and Rome put a dictator on top of them, Herod, a secular dictator which suppressed his own people. Uh, and Roman culture, Hellenism, penetrated into Jewish life and made many Jews, you know, uh, impressed by the godless Greeks. And uh, in the face of that, Jews gave different answers. Uh, the, the, the Pharisees, rigid, you know, cl clinged on to the law very rigidly. It's a bit like some of the religious schools of Islamic thought today. There was a particular school of thought, a movement within the Pharisees, it's called Zealots. They started to attack Romans, and they were the terrorists of the day. Uh, there were other Jews, you know, uh, who were more mystical than so on. So some of the uh, responses Muslims have given to it is similar to that trauma, that the Western is no better. So I just use that to, you know, compare this. But having said all that, I think we are in a better position right now in the 21st century. And I think the, uh, the, the rise of more totalitarian understanding of Islam is discredited. You know, gradually. I mean, few people want to be another Iran, really, in the Middle East. And the, in the Arab Spring especially, I mean, the masses, when you look at what they demand, they were not demanding another theocratic state. They were demanding freedom. You know, freedom is a basic idea. And when you start to speak about freedom, you will ultimately come to new questions about your individual freedom, freedom of the non-Muslims, freedom of people who don't want to be pious, and so on. So I think that's the direction that's where we're heading. Uh, yeah, it was a long answer, but yeah, I think it was a bad century, but I think this one is a little bit better, as I think so. Thank you very much. Anybody else have questions? Thank you very much for this interesting uh, speech. I would like to wonder, do we need extra ideology uh, except Islam to prove Islam is a peaceful religion? Why don't we use Islamic philosophy or Islamic tools? Because I'm not today Turkey and uh, Ihsan el and uh, some of this part and last century our out of Turkey, France, from Ali Shariat says Islam seems more uh, communism or socialism, and in, uh, at the same time, Jebed Pasha says liberalism seems Islam very much than uh, socialism. So, do we need its really synthesis? If you want. Yeah. Well, we probably need because Islam doesn't explain everything. We think that it is. It it, it does. It doesn't. I mean, Islam doesn't tell you whether you should live in a republic or a kingdom. Islam doesn't tell you whether you should have a federation or a unitary state. Islam doesn't even tell you that there should be a state or not. I mean, uh, should you have a, uh, like a, a nation state, an empire, a city state? There are many things that are part of our life, especially political phenomena, if you discuss them that are not explicitly explained by Islam. And when we say Islam, you might find an Islamic thinker who said something on maybe one of these issues, but that's his idea. I mean, Mahabharati had a political theory according to his time, but what happened was that in the early centuries, Islamic thinkers, like Mahabharati, for example, Mahabharati in, in English, that's how they say that. He looked at the time, when you look at, for example, the political ideas of early Islam, you will always see that they speak of constraining the sultan with sharia. So they accept that there is a sultan, because that's the political norm of the time. They don't imagine a republic. I mean, the Ottoman Empire was an empire, right? There was a sultan. It was an Islamic Islamic. But the sultanhood itself was not Islamic. Today we accept republics, that they're fine. So some things are simply changing, and Islam does not give a very clear form about that. And I think that's very good, because I mean, if it did, it's frozen time. Islam gives us, I think, oh, in religion, it tells what to do you know, about prayers and so on. In, in, I think, social life, it gives us principles. 
A system should be just, a system should protect people, a system should not oppress people, it should protect. According to Imam Shatabi of the 14th century, the whole Sharia has five principles. The protection of life, religion, uh, lineage, property, and intellect. But he said these are the five fundamental principles, but their implementation can change over time. So this means that a Muslim living in the 21st century will face new questions. How to organize a state is a new question. Uh, what about, how will Islam have union laborers? There were no union laborers 10 centuries ago, now we have them. What about the right to strike? I mean, I don't, I mean these are new questions. So that's why I think when we say, I mean, we Muslims have to say, Islam gives us all the answers. I think we're making a mistake. Islam gives us principles that apply to every part of life. That's right, our moral principles are, we can implement, but it doesn't give us formulas. Uh, that's why we need mathematics to, you know, understand how the natural... I mean, we need to... Islam s says things about, for example, animals or plants, but we still need to study biology to learn the details of that. I think the same is for political science. Uh, so, uh, yes, many Islamic thinkers in the 20th century especially, and some in today, in like Isan Eliyachik, I know him well, he's a very important, I think I respect him, but they, they think Islam uh, envisions a... Social is almost a communist model. Uh, well, I disagree. First of all, first of all, I'm not saying that Islam gives us liberalism. I'm not saying that. I think I'm saying liberalism as a modern one among the modern ideas. I find liberalism most helpful as a Muslim in the 20th century. And a, it, is, it doesn't mean that oh, Islam has everything liberalism said in the beginning. I'm not saying that. But if, when you look at Islamic economy, Islamic history, the cons constrainment of the state, individual rights in Islamic law, these are, you know, some, these have some parallelisms with the liberal idea. But of course, liberalism is a new idea because the state is a new idea. The modern state is a new idea. I mean, it's emerged in the Thomas Hobbes and so on. I mean, 10 centuries ago, the state was not something that influenced your life. There were no schools. Today, in you know, a state established schools, right? This is a new phenomenon. Four centuries ago, five centuries ago in Anatolia, if you're looking, you didn't know what the state was. I mean, uh, so if it is opening schools, it's giving a centralized education. What is the content of that education is a new discussion. That's why we said, should the Alevis have their compulsory things in Turkey and so on. So instead of saying that Islam gives us all the answers, we should say Islam gives us eternal principles that Muslims should uh, follow, but they should rethink them in every day and age. Uh, and some things will change. I mean, uh, we, maybe 10 centuries from now, there will be no nation state on earth if we just one global thing, and how to organize that will be a new question. Any more questions? Yeah. Um, you, uh, you drew attention to the, um, to the case of Turkey as a country whose, um, as a society who's achieved a sort of fine balance between um, religion and secularism. Um, I was just wondering and knowing uh, whether you think Turkey has Turkey has a, a way to go in you know anything further to achieve in that sense? Oh yeah, I mean Turkey is far from perfect. I mean we still need a lot of things to do at home. I mean a lot of reforms, democratic reforms that we should take. Um, our Kurdish question is still huge and uh, Kurds there's a violent separate Kurdish movement, that's a problem. That's a big problem. Secondly, the Kurds have still have some rights which are not really granted by the state yet. So, although there has been important reforms in the past 10 years. Uh, I mean, we have uh, angry politicians, we have corrupt politicians, we have everything. We have all the problems in the world that you can imagine. Uh, so, we are far from being a... Really a I mean, I, I also, th that's why I'm not saying Turkey is a model, Arabs should you know, emulate us. I mean, probably some of, they, they should not take some things in our society. I mean, we're too nationalist and too, you know, uh, sometimes too zealous about those things. Uh, but I think the discussion about Islam and modernity is a bit advanced in Turkey when you compare it to other societies in the region. Uh, secular state is yes. Uh, there are people who would still maybe aspire for a religious state of some sort, but uh, there were polls about this, like, the people who want an Islamic state in Turkey is like something like 10%, 12%. Whereas the rest accept a secular state, but they don't, very, uh, the people who want a secularist state, uh, as we used to have, is a small minority. 
And in the book, I make this distinction between a secular state and a secularist state. A secularist state is a state which wants to secularize the citizens, which wants to bend their practices, which one bends their Sufi orders, their headscarves, uh, their call to prayers, and so on. And that, and that was the bad model we had until very recently. So uh, in Turkey, so there, in other words, the problem was not oppression from, of the religious people, oppression from, or the problem was not Islamic authoritarianism, the problem was secular authoritarianism. And that's why many uh, ladies in Turkey who wear the veil had come to Europe to have education. And they discovered that actually there's something called a free society. You know, they, they, can, they, they, wanted, they want the same thing back at home. Uh, so we need to liberalize our secularism for these discussions, but we are progressively you know, going there. We need a new constitution, a civilian, uh, liberal constitution, which will secure rights and also diffuse political power. You know, too much concentration of power is always a problem. Uh, but having said all those, I think in the past 10 years, the reforms that we have achieved, uh, and, and I think the consolidation of democracy in Turkey is admirable. Uh, and, uh, and at the very least, we don't believe that there will be a military coups anymore. And that's a big thing. I mean, in Turkey, once in 10 years, the military was coming, they were killing prime ministers and torturing people and then going back. And that was kind of the place. Uh, torture is one of the past in Turkey today. And the European Union has been helpful, I should say, uh, for some of these reforms. Although the European Union is not that promising anymore. And, uh, not, the, not because of the British, but because of the French, mainly. <laughs> and it's an irony that, you know, as a French wannabe nation, we are now being rejected by the French. I think we should get a lesson from that. I have a question for me. Sorry? I have a question Oh, yeah, sure. Me. Okay. So, um, a lot of the time, like, I think it's the... It, a lot of the time, um, piety has been abused by political forces that aren't really Islamic themselves. And you have the increase of deprivation as well as a radicalization for political purposes. Like in um, the US-Saudi um, relationship to, or, or partnership to get rid of the Soviets in the 70s, which has continued. And so why yours is a very erudite mission and a very recognized and reasonable stance, it's not necessarily going to filter through to people who need it most who aren't very well educated and don't have the access to that. So what grassroots approach would you advocate in order to uh, break this cycle of misunderstanding and violence? Well, you point to something very important, and that is the political context. I mean, it, I mean, people become radicals generally for some reason. I mean, in Turkey, for example, we have the PKK, a violent terrorist movement that I denounce. But I also understand why there's a PKK, because of the suppression of the Kurdish uh, part of the society uh, for decades and decades, and a lot of state of violence. And, uh, so this, this creates a political context in which only radical ideas can emerge. Uh, I understand why you know, Palestine is a place which has bred so many violent movements because they are under Israeli occupation since you know, the middle of the 20th century, at least since 1967. Uh, what do you expect you know, from such a society? Of course they should be nonviolent. that's why you know, I, want, I would say to all the Palestinians, but you know, I, I can also understand why people become more, uh, more enraged. And in societies like Afghanistan or Pakistan, yes, for example, in Pakistan, for example, there is one irony. Uh, nationalism and the passion for Islam gets, you know, uh, fused in, into the same thing. Uh, because Pakistan is a nation of Muslims. So sometimes um, what is expressed as Islam is actually a national sentiment uh, as a passion for Islam. Uh, because the thing is, Here's a, here's a difference between actually being a Muslim and a nationalist. A nationalist, by definition, sees, sees the other people as the other, right? There's no way that you can make the British a Turk. There's no way that you, the, the French will be Turkish. I mean, you, they can become citizen, but you know, culturally, it's something different. But Islam is a universalist religion, like Christianity. 
which would actually want to win those people, at least win those hearts, which means that it should be open to those people and show them the beauty, beauty of Islam and so on. In Turkey, like the Nur movement that I mentioned, or the Gulen movement, are coming from this understanding. So they want to reach out and to show that Islam is not a bad religion, or to show the morality or the virtues of Muslims to others, and that's make them much more universal. But if you turn Islam into a religion, and you say, this is the nationalism of the Ummah, you know, uh, then you actually start to lose the meaning of Islam. In, in Malaysia, there was a very interesting discussion about this. I mean, I don't know what's your opinion about that, but uh, there was, I think Malaysian Muslims uh, did not allow Christians to use the word Allah. Uh, I, I would respect your point of view about that, but mine is this. Uh, why Muslims should worry about that? I mean, the thing is, Allah means the God in Arabic. Arab Christians use it all the time. Uh, Arab Christians don't have any other word than Allah for God. And if a Christian says Allah, I'm saying, great, I mean, he's, he's referring to God. Of course, he has a different notion, theology about that, but, uh, but, you know, but in Malaysia, it is a kind of us against them. And what defines us as the ethnic community is Islam. But that adds a different dimension to it. Um, so I think these political issues should be discussed and I think realized. And, and it should be deconstructed, you know, where is this thing coming from? Well, as for this grassroots approach, what are we going to do, you know, how are we going to make these ideas more popular? Well, I don't know, I'm just writing a book and, you know, writing articles and speaking to audiences here and there. My book will be in Turkish soon, it will be in Arabic as well. And, uh, of course, I mean, there's no way to, you can speak and engage in people who don't want to listen to it, or who don't have the means to understand it. Uh, but I think it, it is also important, for example, I don't expect that my book will be read in all the medrasas in Pakistan and it will be, you know, guiding them. No, but there are intellectuals in Pakistan, for example, uh, some of whom are, you know, uh, maybe open to these ideas. At least they, they see a value in the service. In, in discussing these ideas, so this is a huge, this is a one billion people. It's it's a, it's, the, it's I mean it's not nothing changes so fast, uh, but I think again political context is very important, and generally the roots of rigidity are political conflicts. You know in Turkey, uh, the uh, we can discuss about Islam and democracy and liberalism. That discussion becomes most impossible when Israel bombs Gaza or something, because that's shows the West as the ultimate enemy, West by extension from Israel, and even Western ideas get trashed in that. And I don't see liberalism as an exclusively Western idea, but it's, immer it's flourished in the West, a bit, you know, or democracy, the same thing, flourished in the West a bit earlier than other civilizations, but I see it as a universal idea. Uh, so, as for the masses, you can only change the, try to change the political context, and that's things that the political leaders can do. Uh, and, you know, they should bomb less places in the world, basically. Uh, but as for reaching out to people, well, we try. I mean, we just, uh, I try, I just try, many people try, and we'll see what happens. And your video will go to a lot of people, right? Hopefully. <laughs> awesome. uh, do we have further questions? Yes. Yeah. Uh, Sorry, um, so, uh, basically, if you have a Muslim community in certain circles, um, the more pious um, that interpretation may seem to society as a whole, and how do you think um, we should stop the cycle? Uh, the cycle of um, rigidity and piety? Yeah. It's a good question. So, it is thought that if you're very godly, you should be very rigid, rigid and angry. Huh? Uh, we should, well, there are Movements which disprove that. I mean, in Turkey, the movements that I mentioned actually are known to be very, uh, like, peaceful and tolerant and very godly. So I think creating also, a, like, examples. I mean, the, here's this dichotomy. In the 20th century, the Islamic world, everywhere in the Islamic country, had the image of this westernized elite. Okay? These were the people who became so-called liberals because they were whining and dining, and that's what became the definition of a liberal, uh, and who knew, had global Western tastes and so on. And they were seen as deviant, corrupt, you know, people who lost 
who they are by the pious, and you had this dichotomy. That's why I think having a Muslim uh, pious yet liberal elite, a cultural elite, is very important. Um, and showing the examples of that uh, is, is very important. Uh, uh, and what you're saying is true. It is perceived that if you're too religious, you should be a, like a, a like a angry man who is very rigid and intolerant, and so on. That is, in some interpretations, like in, especially in the Wahhabi uh, tradition, the Salafi tradition, there are rules which you which you uh, which should, which leads you to behave that way. Uh, I mean, there are even some Islamic sources which says, not Islamic, but you know, in, in the Islamic tradition, laughing is not good for Muslims or something. I mean, it's uh, the idea of some medieval imam, basically. It's nothing Quranic. Uh, so the, the answer to that would be to create opposite answers uh, by individuals or also by movements. And to claim uh, a position which is both Islamic legitimate and is both, both open-minded and democratic-minded. Yeah. In your opinion, should Sharia law be abolished? No, I'm not saying that. <laughs> I think the principles and the purposes of the Sharia should be the, 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 uh, the focus. And uh, I think some of the elements in Sharia, uh, such as... Um, these things like, I mean, the oppression of women in some Sharia uh, injunctions, a, like the limits on, like the limits on individual liberty, and I dis discuss some of those in the law. I mean, I'm not if if we say let's abolish Sharia, that's the end of the debate. But other people will say, why are we abolishing it? So of course they will want Sharia, and of course we should understand why Sharia is so respectable for Muslims. I mean, for the Westerners, it's some I know it's something unimaginable. There are people who want to cut people's hands and lash women, and why do you want it that much? You know, like the, that's that's their image of the Sharia. Well, first of all, Sharia has a res the term, the very term Sharia has a respect in the Muslim society, most Muslim societies. First of all, it's considered as divine law, although it's not divine law. It is, it is law based on some divine principles, but articulated by men ultimately. But secondly, historically, Sharia was what protected the society from rulers, oppressive rulers. I mean, Sharia was not created by sultans. Sharia was created by scholars, one of who, and their intention, most of the time, was to constrain the sultan from, for example, uh, confiscating property. Uh, in that sense, it was a bit like the natural law tradition in Europe, in which law was there in, 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 in nature, built by God, and the scholars discovered it, and the sultan could not. That's why, for example, in the Ottoman Empire, when the Sultan did something unjust, like overtaxed people, people would march to the palace saying, we want Sharia, which means behave, we don't just, you know, we, we want justice. So that, there's that historical legacy, so that, that's why I think Sharia is a respectable concept, and it's really going to keep on probably being a respectable concept, but that's, that's okay. But what we mean by Sharia, and I think I'm focusing on the purposes of Sharia, uh, is, is a more important debate. In places like Turkey, we don't have Sharia law as an official uh, code, and that's fine, and you know, that's not a problem in that sense. But in places, uh, in, in Islamic countries, which see Sharia as a principle for legislation, uh, I think there needs to be some uh, questioning of the, some of the classical Sharia injunctions, which are, as, as, as I tried to explain, are showing us the context of the uh, early Islamic society, uh, not the eternal thing, the rules of Islam. If I may jump in. Sure, there was one thing awesome. there. Yeah. Sure. Uh, I was just going to ask, how would you define democracy? Because basically in Turkey, because you just talked about fair and fair elections, so is that all by what you, what you mean by democracy? And another thing is that you said that it's admirable, um, the progress in Turkey. But I just read that basically there's a recently changed law where um, on a train, when you're traveling on a train, then a man passenger cannot sit with a woman passenger. So I found it quite sexist, and it's like basically treating every man as a potential raper. Um, I mean, if democracy is also about equal rights and stuff, 
So, and since that's a recently changed law, how would you say that there is a progress? And another thing is that basically I'm a bit confused on that. Because it's like um, I found what you said a bit contradictory in terms of um, how would I work? Okay. So first, you said that um, basically you advocate secular state. Am I, am I right? Yeah. Okay. But then a secular state within its nature, so it means that... What nation? Gov- its nature. Yeah. Nature. So it's like government and religion, they go separately. So religion should not dominate um, like how the government is run and stuff. Mm-hmm. Okay, then, I mean, why would you say that Petrullah Gulen, like, he, he thinks that Islam is a way of democracy? I mean, why would you think those? What I mean is that you say, you know, it's democratic, but then you say that for Islam it's better, you know, adopt a liberal democratic approach. Uh-huh. I find it quite confusing. Yeah, so I sat because I was tired. Yeah. It's all right. I mean, it's like then it's it's just as like you're adopting an approach instead of a democratic approach and not democratic but dictatorial approach. Mm-hmm. You're just saying that we should adopt um, like a liberal democratic approach, but together with Islam, isn't that a bit contradictory? Okay, you asked several things. Let me try to answer. Thank you for your questions. Um, well, what is democracy? First of all, I uh, I make a distinction between liberal democracy and illiberal democracy. So liberalism is even a more important value for me than democracy, I should say. Um, because these are two different things. Liberalism is a basically a political philosophy which upholds individual rights. Democracy is a process which tells us how the state will function. And I, I value democracy, uh, but I think democracy and the liberal idea should be, constitutional liberalism should be synthesized, and that's what we call liberal democracy, and I, I think it's a good system. Well, with flaws, but you know, better than other systems. So what is democracy? Well, democracy is basically a political system in which the rulers are uh, responsible to the people. Uh, free and fair elections is the very basic, you know, I think. If you don't have free and fair elections in a society, you cannot speak of democracy. But that's not enough. There should be free media, there should be unions, there should be some society organizations, there should be separation of powers, and so on. So that you can refine democracy in various ways. Is How is Turkey doing in this matter? Well, as I said, Turkey is doing not too bad, but not perfect. I mean, we had evolved, I mean, our democracy has evolved, I would say, in the past 10, 15 years, and European progress reports basically have notified that, although they criticize Turkey. And I, as I said, I mean, I think Turkish democracy is far from perfect, far from being perfectly liberal. Uh, and, uh, and I criticize some of the things that probably you would criticize. Now, as for the rule on trains and women, well, I don't think it's a law. I mean, I heard this briefly. Uh, I don't think it's a law passed by the parliament. I think it might be a, like, a implementation in a particular train line. I mean, I don't think it's a national. I mean, I, well, I, I get on the Istanbul metro and I sit with women and don't, they don't. No, not metro, trains. Trains. Okay. In national, nationwide. Yes. That's what I read. Okay, I have not. That's not what I've heard, and that's not what I've experienced, or. That's what I know, but you know, I I've heard that. In, I think in a Konya train, that's what I heard. Konya Ankara, that's a contr- pretty yeah, conservative city. Line. Yeah, that's a pretty conservative. It's a Konya Ankara. That's a new line. I think it was discussed there. Here's my take. Like, I'm not offended a woman sitting near me. I'm not. I'm not offended to sit near a woman. And I think that's great. But there might be a woman, very conservative, who might not want males sitting next to them. That demand is a democratic demand. So democracy doesn't mean that you will impose a particular way of life. A conservative way of life 
could also exist in democracy. And let me give you an example. In Israel, they have buses that are separate only for men in the Ma'ashadim, in the, the conservative neighborhoods. Of, I mean, I, that's, those buses are not my favorites, but, you know, if a lot of people want it that way, then the local government there decide, can uh, serve it that way. There are other examples like this. I mean, for example, uh, drinking in the United States is more difficult than in Europe. I mean, you can't drink before you're 21. You have to show an I have to show an ID to enter a place which is sold, even though I'm going to buy it. You know, I have to show an ID that I'm older than 21, although I, I look a little older than 21. I'm a little older than 21. So, I mean, societies have their norms, and these norms change over time. And I'm, generally, I'm in favor of a more liberal culture, but if some conservative people have demanded this, maybe the train company or the train administration have brought a rule like that. So I don't see this as a threat to democracy. Although that's not really my favorite form of organizing I, trade. I, just, I mean, I just remembered about that law, but I mean, it can't be an, what you're saying, I don't, I, I, it can't be an excuse. It's like, then in Europe, why isn't it like legal to sit with a man or a woman? I mean, I it, should, I mean it should be. It, yeah, it should be legal. It's like in much higher levels in Europe, then why is it like legal to sit with a man or with a It's not a matter, I mean, democracy, so okay, democracy people. is about uh, people uh, expressing their demands and the people in charge responding to those demands, right? Now, that demand can be, uh, well, imagine this is, imagine this is like speculating here. Imagine there's a very conservative neighborhood in Istanbul, and thousands of women go there and say, "Well, we want a park only which only women will go there because we don't want to be, you know, we we want to have a sun bath there and close it, so we want to be only as females. No men will enter there. Now, if this is a public demand, I think it is only democratic that the government answers to that." Well, you can say there. Well, you can say no, no. You should be all together. That's more modern. Well, no. They want the other way. If they want the other way, then that's democratic to address it. So, uh, the secular way of life is not more democratically legitimate than the ultra conservative, I think, way of life. And I think Israel has good answers to this uh, thing. I mean, uh, very conservative Jews live very conservatively in Israel, and they have their own cultural spaces to live that way. In that case, Sorry, may I please restrict your, sure. your um, follow-up questions? Yeah. Mustafa, may I ask you how many more questions you'd be willing to take? Okay, it depends on my train. So, like, I have an 8.15 train at uh, the wrong station that I got okay. in. Okay, shall we say two more questions? Yeah, two more questions. It. Let's okay. see you by 7.30ish, okay? Okay, okay. so Ines. Yes. Yeah, sure. Sorry, uh, let's discuss it later by email. But I, I, I see your point, but my point is a little different, but we can discuss it. But thank you. Sorry. Okay, I'll be quick. I'll just say I'm sure. sorry for coming up here talking. No, no, okay. um, I'm just going to uh, ask very quickly if, uh, what your view is on um, Islam as a source of uh, agency in the Arab, uh, hope you haven't talked too much about this, in the Arab uh, writing. As an actor in the Arab writing? As a uh, source of agency, as a um, um, sort of. Sorry? Capitalist? Yes. The Catholics. It's partly yes. Because some of the... Well, the Arab risings are not Islamic risings. It is a general uprising against uh, tyrannical authoritarian rule. Uh, but <coughs> among the masses, there are people who are inspired by Islam. And most of them are inspired by Islam. There are people who are exclusively inspired by some of the Islamic parties. In Tunis it was the Nahda, in, in Egypt it was the Muslim Brotherhood and the Salafis. In Syria, the opposition is for the Muslim, Syrian Muslim Brotherhood in, in, in Syria, and some other Islamic groups. But also there are some secular liberals in the same uprising. There are leftist Democrats and socialists, some Christians, you know, in, 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 in uh, Ethan Qatar Square. So it is a general uh, in, in all of these societies, there is, all, of course, a social class that identifies itself with the authoritarian regime. I mean, Mubarak has its own supporters, the people who like Mubarak. Or the, in Tunisia, 
uh, particularly upper, upper, secular upper, upper class secular people like the regime, the former regime. In Syria, you know, the, uh, the uh, Alevis of Syria, Nusayis it's called, or some, you know, uh, uh, elites in Damascus like the current regime. I mean, Hitler had it as his fans, right? And Stalin had it as his fans. So every authoritarian regime has a social base. But the rest of the society is oppressed and they do not like the uh, current structure. So, in that sense, Islam, I think, has contributed in a sense that it's helped mobilize maybe the Muslim Brotherhood, it helped mobilize the Syrian uh, opposition, but it is not the only actor. And that's good. It means that Islam is participating in a, a movement which is not solely defined by Islam. Of course, there is a bad example which gives a little bit of suspicion to people about this. People sometimes remind, well, the Shah and his you know, disposal was a bit similar. You know, the, the Iranian Revolution was not just by driven by the Khomeini and the Islamic movement, but also by communists in Iran, the socialists, and so on. Yes, uh, but I don't think we are at that stage of history right now. I don't think that's where uh, Egypt is heading. Uh, in the Iranian case, the the Shia scholars were so well organized and so charismatic. And so Khomeini established his own uh, theocratic system. And the non-Islamic element was so, uh, actually weak in Iran. But in, I think in Egypt, in Tunisia, in Syria, the Islamic groups are a bit more democratic-minded when, when compared with the uh, system in Iran. Plus, uh, I'm not saying all Islamic groups. I mean, Salafis in Egypt are really not that promising at all. But uh, th there is a reform movement in the Muslim movement. There is some change. Plus, uh, the non-Islamic elements are also very strong. And I don't think that, and the signs so far show that the Islamic groups want to engage in the system, not, not just define the whole system. Okay. So yeah, it's an actor, but a, a modest actor, and I think that's, uh, that's a good sign. May I ask a question? Sure. Thank you. Um, we probably have to go, so maybe one last question. After yours. After this, or, yeah. Um, so, yeah, because I don't want to say the mind for loss. Um, my question is to do with um, your future in contributing to this cause. Um, firstly, are, is, are there any exciting developments that have transpired as of yesterday in the parliament that you could tell us about? Um. And uh, what have you learned that was new since you wrote the book? which will take you perhaps in a new direction, and us. I was knighted yesterday. Okay. <laughs> uh, in my speech yesterday, well, the parliament speech was hosted by Council of Arab-British Understanding. It was in a very fancy room, you know, it was a few, few centuries old. So you're asking what happened in that like, speech? What are the exciting developments or, that took place? Or, or Since that speech? Um, well, just, what can you see, foresee from that? I mean, what direction did it, what, what new directions did it take the discourse in? What were the contributions? And well, I mean, I spoke at the parliament, but I had not spoke to the whole parliament, so it was not a, you know, like there were, an audience a little more than this, and uh, it was mostly people outside. There was only one MP who chaired the event. But it was like a, a crowd like you, some students and some, uh, some academics. And it was, I mean, I didn't, it was a good meeting and I shared some things that, like I did here. It was a little different to, uh, talk, but some similarities. Uh, and I think people are in need of seeing different, uh, hearing different voices of Islam. And I think the Turkish experience means something to, today. And people are trying to understand, and people see Turkey from outside, yes, it's trying to join the EU, there are a few basic lines, there are some criticisms towards the Turkish government too, and some of them are valid. Uh, but what is the, what's the backside of that? What's the story? What's the subtext? You know, what's going on in Turkey? And wh why Turkey has been this way? And let me say this, I'm not saying that Turkey today is the beacon of liberal understanding of Islam. I'm saying Turkey is closer to it, and, and there are some good signs to think that it is. But there are a lot of, uh, and there are a lot of close-minded Islamic thinking in Turkey as well. I shouldn't really whitewash. So maybe that train is not a great idea, as you said in Turkey. But you know, we can we'll, we promise to discuss that later. Uh, 
Um, and so, and you also asked what developments I expect for the future. Um, what are your What are the further developments in your thoughts and in your understanding since you wrote Islam without extremes? Um, well, the reactions I'm getting is that, first of all, methodologically we should so solve some issues in, in Islam. Actually, the question you asked, why do we need things other than Islam, is an important question. I mean, is there room for debate to begin with? But, and it's interesting that today, but things are changing gradually. Like, there were Islamic thinkers in Turkey 20 years ago who would say democracy is a system of kufr, which means disbelief. It's a satanic system. The West created it for its own evil ends. It has nothing to do with Islam. It has nothing to do with it. Now, that is really a funny, that would be a very funny idea. Too. Nobody would say that. People would say they're very marginal. Democracy actually became the Islamic ideal. But if you look at democracy, it's a Greek word, demos. You know, it came from obviously Western literature. Uh, but, but now many Muslims think, yes, democracy is great. Now what changed, you know, well, gradually you understand that it's not a bad idea, and then you also start to see the parallelisms with that and your values. But it, it means that now some reaction is shown to liberalism saying that this is a Western agenda, blah, 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 it's a foreign idea. Well, everything is a foreign idea. I mean, many, many things are foreign ideas. I mean, abolition of slavery in Islam was a foreign idea. You should see that. I mean, the Quran uh, encouraged many mission, and, uh, this, but slavery as an institution was not abolished in, in classical Islam. <laughs> Even in the Ottoman Empire, I mean, there was uh, slavery until mid-19th century. And thanks to British pressure, slavery was banned. Slave trade was banned in the Ottoman Empire in the 1860s. And when Ottomans banned mm -hmm. slave trade, there was a rebellion against the Ottoman Empire in Saudi no, not Saudi at the time, in, in today's Saudi Arabia, the Wahhabis, they said slavery is in Sharia, how dare you abolish it. They were of course profiting from that, but you know, they also referred to it. So, we should learn, maybe you sometimes learn things from other people, that's fine, and it's, it's okay, and uh, maybe we should question ourselves, why did not we abolish <laughs> slavery until the 19th century, but we did not, obviously. It doesn't mean that slavery was as bad as, I mean, it was not industrial, it was household, and you could say the conditions of slaves were better in the Islamic world, but it was slavery after all. Uh, and uh, so, no, no Muslims would now say slavery is in the Sharia, so we should have it. Uh, I, I see it as a historical institution which the Sharia addressed, but, you know, times, times have changed, and I think norms have changed. Thank you for your insight. In yeah. the interest of time... Yeah, I think we should yeah, start to go. Yes. Yeah. If so, you want to buy books, there are four of them here. You know, so and it's all on Amazon.co.uk. <laughs> you can buy it on Kindle. <laughs> it's a good read. It won't be boring. <laughs> but thanks for coming.